of like would have looked like prior to drainage, you know, in about the middle 1800s. And the Everglades literally was this river of grass. We would have these seasonal flows coming out of Lake Okeechobee during the during the wet season. <clears throat> this would overflow through this sawgrass plain into this major landscape feature, which we call the Ridge and Slough landscape. And that's this landscape here on the right here in this picture here. Um, actually, are you seeing my pointer or should I? Yeah. Okay, I'm actually gonna see if I can. Okay, I'll just use this. We can see your pointer. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, so there's this area here, this Ridge and Slough, it's this, um, uh, kind of a corrugated kind of landscape of these higher elevation sawgrass ridges, lower elevation, deeper water open sloughs, and it's interspersed with these biological hotspots of the freshwater Everglades called tree islands. And, um, you know, so, so this is kind of the main feature area of landscape feature of the Everglades. Um, water would then flow further to the south. Um, you know, and as it went, flowed through to the south, it would flow over these sort of purple pinkish areas, which we call the Mull Prairies. These are sort of higher elevation, shallower marshes. Um, it would then follow on through to through these coastal lakes and mangrove forests shown in green and either out into Florida Bay or into the Gulf of Mexico. And um, sort of supporting, you know, providing um, these flow channels into these area were these three major sloughs. So we have this Taylor Slough here, that's the main flowway into Florida Bay that supports most of the freshwater entering uh, Florida Bay. We have Shark River Slough, which is by far the largest in terms of volumes of water exiting the Everglades. That primarily flows into the Gulf of Mexico, but may also um, have impacts on Florida Bay as well. We're still trying to determine that. And also this um, very well um, named Lossman Slough. This, this is a slough that's really been sort of forgotten by many ecologists um, and, and uh, restoration uh, scientists. Um, and this really was the area that supported, provided most of the flowways through to the major colonies it, it supported an area called the Fertile Crescent. There's this area here called the Fertile Crescent, and that's where about 90% of the birds historically nested. This is where we would see those super colony events of hundreds of thousands of birds. But we really aren't looking at this area and the, the mall prairies um, that support the foraging for those birds. So this is an area that's coming to light just recently, and I'm gonna be talking about that a little more. So, and here we have that, these mull prairies here. You can see that they're shallower, more grass-like. Um, they really do look like the prairies, but they are actually, you know, they would actually get to a foot, foot and a half deep um, during the wet season. So, you know, this watery landscape, um, you know, historically had this, supported this huge abundance and biodiversity of life. So you've probably heard all about the wading birds, the hundreds of thousands of wading birds that, that nested in, in the Everglades, particularly in the Southern Everglades. But it also supported, you know, very healthy populations of predators, at American alligators in the freshwater system, sharks, American crocodiles, even Caribbean monk seals in, in Florida Bay historically before they went extinct. And of course, mi literally millions of wintering birds, uh, shorebirds, waterfowl, uh, seabirds. And even as uh, Dr. Whitfield explained to you guys uh, a few months ago, even you know, fairly large populations of nesting flamingos. So you know, it really was this treasure trove of diversity in the Everglades. But unfortunately, as is often the case, um, paradise found is often paradise lost. And, you know, as not shortly after, you know, white um, Europeans arrived on the scene, um, things started to go bad in the Everglades. Um, nowadays, we have lost approximately half the Everglades to agricultural development up here under Lake Okeechobee and urban development. 
And, and much of what have is left has been drained by hundreds of miles of canals and has been compartmentalized, excuse me, has been compartmentalized um, um, into these impoundments surrounded by levees. And of course, all this has had a major impact. It's, we have much less water now flowing through the system and particularly in this southern part of the system down here in the south. So we have much less water, fresh water flowing now out into Florida Bay and these mild prairies and the coastal regions are much drier and much more saline than they were historically. And Florida Bay also is much more saline than it used to be. And of course, this has had major consequences for the ecology of the system. So uh, wading birds, for instance, the, 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 species, the, the group of animals that I'm um, a specialist in and have been studying for the last 20 odd years have, have declined dramatically. These are major indicators of the health of the, of the Everglades. They represent the, the hydrologic conditions in the Everglades. And sort of in this time period from the 1940s to you know, the early 2000s, they declined dramatically with, um, particularly for these tactile foraging species, you know, these species that feed by touch, such as the wood stalks and the, and the white ibis that have declined by 87% and 78% um, respectively dur during this period. Um, Another thing that we've witnessed is that these birds are now have moved from these coastal colonies. So here's that um, fertile crescent that I was telling you where historically all these birds nested down here in southwestern Everglades. Um, and they've moved primarily um, to, the, to the freshwater wetlands. There's very few birds now that nest along the coast. Uh, most of the large colonies are in the, these impounded wetlands. The, the water conservation areas. So just to give you a, an idea of where we are with all this, this is the Lotsahatchee National Wildlife Refuge up here. Um, West Palm Beach would be about here. Miami would be about here. These are the water conservation areas. This is Big Cypress National Preserve, and this is Everglades National Park with Florida Bay below it, just to give you a sense of where everything is and where, where I'm talking about during this presentation. Sorry, I keep doing that. I've got Scott's disease, I think. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, many of the birds left these historic um, uh, colonies. A major goal of restoration is to return these birds, get them breeding again where they did historically. And many of these birds did actually left the Everglades entirely. And, and you know, we, we saw increases in Northern Florida and even Georgia, um, once many of the sort of implementations of drainage were put into place back in the 1940s and 50s. All right, and probably um, the most distressing from a personal level is we've also seen um, a delay in the timing of nesting of the wood stalks. These birds historically nested in November, December. Uh, now they're nesting in February, March. And, th and these birds have a very long nesting period, about four months. So if they delay nesting, they often end up um, having their chicks still in the nest at the beginning of the rainy season. Once that happens, water level rises, their prey disperses, they're unable to feed their chicks and the chicks, the chicks often, the nests fail and the chicks die. And um, the most dr dramatic in recent years of this happening was actually not long ago, in, back in 2020, 2020, when we had 95% of the, of the nests failed. We had a pretty good nesting season, um, 1,200, 1,300 nests in, in the Everglades and 95% of those nests failed, pretty much just prior to when they were about to fledge as well. So, you know, th this is a little distressing before I show you all the good news, but it's good to show you that bad things happen as well. So this is, a, you know, we've got a, an adult wood stalk here sitting next to a nest full of bones and looking on, poss possibly, hopefully not, its own nest with a vulture eating its offspring. And here on the right, we have a, another sort of wider view of the nests. And all these are just bones and feathers in the nests. They've, they've just all starved to death. And actually, I, wanna, I want you to remember this photo for a bit later on, because I've got a much happier photo 
from this year showing pretty much the same area. So that's all the bad news. So despite all this, this presentation is actually a story of hope, of ecological resilience, and the Everglades' incredible powers of recovery. So in the fall, the autumn of 2020, um, November 2020, Hurricane, uh, at the time actually Tropical Storm Eta, passed over Florida Bay and the lower Florida Peninsula and created this deluge of almost biblical proportions on Southern Florida. This resulted in flows returning to, you know, you know, we think of these deluges and these biblical floods as bad things, but this was actually in many ways a creator of life and um, provided the flows again um, that we haven't seen since the 1930s and 40s flowing through into southern Florida, uh, sorry, through southern Everglades and into um, uh, Florida Bay. And so in this presentation, I'm going to sort of be talking about the incredible responses, particularly from the wading birds um, uh, and how, you know, and, and what this means in terms of Everglades restoration and what we've learned in terms of the science. And, and I'm going to do that by breaking this presentation into two main parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about the incredible wading bird responses in 2021. And to a certain extent, and to a certain extent, also in during 2018, which was a very similar year in terms of the hydrology being affected by Hurricane Irma and the response we had in 2018. I'm going to talk about the reasons why these birds responded in the way they did, and I'm going to talk about why this gives me so much hope, and what we learned in terms of it, so much hope in terms of Everglades restoration. And you know how much we learn from a scientific perspective as well. And then in the second part, I'm going to go through this, um, show you this photographic journey. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of videos and photos that I took during my surveys of the Everglades during this period, showing you the incredible, as Marianne explained earlier, the incredible uh, wading bird, massive wading bird colonies, the the huge flocks of wading birds feeding in the Everglades, as well as some of the some of the other, you know, cool species, some of the other bird species and some of the predatory species as well. So, OK, so um, I'm trying to rush through this a bit just because I have so many slides, but I'll try and slow down now. Now we've got that introduction out of the way. So so I'm going to first start by showing you the number of nests, um, you know, the nesting patterns that we've seen in the Everglades over the last 30 years or so, just to show you some of the changes we've seen from these wading birds over the, you know, over the recent decades. And so this figure shows the number of wading bird nests for our four indicator species. So that's the wood stork, the white ibis, um, the great egret, and the snowy egret. In, in the Everglades, so that's Everglades National Park, plus the water conservation areas, from 1986 for starters up to 2017. And the first thing we can really see is that there are these sort of long-term um, changes in, in how the wading birds are responding. So, you know, we're seeing this huge jump from only about five to 7,000 nests on average in the, in the 80s and 90s, up to about 30,000 nests starting in about the year 2000. So, and that's kind of, you know, we don't know the exact reasons why that happened, but it was uh, in association with um, climatic shifts. It, uh, we, we went into a wetter period climatically. Um, we changed um, some of the laws regarding uh, mercury methylation, mercury uh, burning of trash, which was having an impact in the Everglades. Um, and it's also a time where we started to have a much better communication between scientists like myself um, and water managers. So we, were, we, were, we sort of had a much better understanding of how to manage the system and we were improving the way that we were actually communicating that to the water managers. So an, another thing we can see is that we've got these, you know, these 
um, large nesting events and very low nesting events. We go from highs to lows, kind of on a two to three year um, cycle. And that's, that's natural. That's just what these wading birds do. That's what they did historically. And it's a, basically a natural response to fluctuating hydrologic conditions and, and prey availability. And, you know, and that's exactly what we want to see. Um, although historically we would have seen much, you know, these highs would have been much larger. So, and then, you know, from about 2009 afterwards, oh, 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 I would just point out that, you know, some of these highs were pretty impressive, even in the early 2000s. So, you know, our previous uh, banner year, 2009, we had 63,000 nests, I believe, for, for these four species and, and over 70,000 for all species combined. So, so that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, we were seeing some pretty good nesting events in these years. 2002 was another very good nesting event. Um, but then in 2017, in the fall of 2017, we had Hurricane Irma pass over, the, over South Florida. Again, it dumped a huge amount of water, created flows and conditions that were very conducive to wading bird nesting. And um, in a minute, I'm going to show you what happened in 2018. We, I've showed, I showed you this back in 2019. Um, I still get very excited when I show you this. It's just such an incredible thing to see, just such an amazing jump that we saw. So this is the number of birds for the, just for these four species, I might add, uh, in 2018. So we had this incredible 116,000 nests. Now that's you know, that's almost double what we had in 2009, um, almost four times the, the four year average that we had. Uh, but most crucially, it's comparable to what we had in, you know, the 1930s and 40s in the pre drainage period. We were getting back to, to what we had historically. And this is really largely before we've implemented Everglades restoration in any meaningful way. So no, that was just an incredible, just an incredible event to see. Um, subsequent to that, we had two years, 2019 and 2020, where you know numbers dropped down again. That's okay. That's to be expected. You know, these years were fairly dry. We predicted pretty very closely what we were going to expect to see in these years. But then, as I noted earlier. In the fall of 2020, we had um, a tropical storm uh, um, pass over us, dump a huge amount of water, and again, we had an enormous nesting event. 93, over 93,000 nests. Now, granted, this isn't quite the heights that we had in 2018, but for a number of reasons that I will explain a little bit later on, I think this was actually a better year for the wading birds than in 2018. Firstly, I'll explain now, is that we're seeing two almost, we, we're not only seeing just one almost once in a lifetime super colony event that hasn't been seen for over 80 years, we're actually seeing two in a four year period which is to me is just mind blowing that we're, we're, you know, we're witnessing this twice in a four year period. Okay. But really what this speaks to me, how this speaks to me is um, this really shows that these birds can bounce back really quickly. It shows that these birds and the Everglades is highly resilient. If we get the water right, even if it's, through the luck to a certain extent uh, of you know, having tropical storm events, the fact that we can get these birds back so quickly and they respond so quickly and the Everglades itself is resilient to be able to do this gives me a lot of hope. It, it enables me to go to water managers and say, look, Everglades restoration works. If we can provide water, the right amount of water, the right time, the right quality in the right place, these birds will come back. The proof is in the pudding. 
And, and that is, is more important than most people realize because, you know, we, we had a really good understanding of wading birds. We know how they, you know, what they do, but, but science is still hypothetical in that sense. Until we can actually show it, as we're doing here, we still really didn't know what we were going to get. So to show that we can do this is just, in my mind, just a marvelous thing. But that isn't the end of the good news, although I will, um, I will go on to more good news in a minute. What we're showing here actually is pretty much the same kind of figures, but it's the number of nests individually for those four indicator species. The white ibis here on the left, great eager here on the top right, the woodstalk bottom left, and the snow eager here on the bottom right. And there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, all these species did well in 2021. Um, the, you know, the white ibis had, you know, over 70,000 nests. The great egret, you know, um, over 12,000 nests. The woodstalk, um, close to 2,500 nests. And the snow egrets, which, and the, and the tricolored heron here below, these guys have been having a real tough time in the last 20 years or so. Um, um, but even these guys so showed some sort of response uh, and improvement. But it really, it's, it's the white ibis that really, really benefits from these sort of, you know, these super wet conditions that we, that we witnessed. So, you know, we've gone from a, an average of 23,000 nests. You know, we had a peak of 45,000 in 2009, but in 2018, we had over 80,000, 90,000 nests. And this year we had um, over 70,000 nests. So, you know, it's those guys that are really, um, you know, really responding in a meaningful way. And, you know, although the white ibis is not the most charismatic of all, the, of all these species, to me, it's probably one of the most important in the Everglades, largely because of the large numbers. It was really you know, when you've got an animal that is so abundant, it has such an effect on the ecology of the rest of the system in the way it transports nutrients, how it provides prey for other species, uh, nutrients for other species, um, you know, and just, you know, how it affects food webs. So, you know, to have this, what was once the most abundant species by far returning in this way it is very, very encouraging. So, um, okay, so another piece of good news, and, th and this is where I think um, we are really seeing the benefit of these flows during 2021, and why I think it's, it's actually better year than 2018. And the reason was be is because nesting was so incredibly successful. Now, I don't have data to back this up yet. We're still waiting from data from the University of Florida. But just um, from anecdotal data, you know, flying over these colonies, taking the photos, seeing just how many of these nests were full of, very, you know, three or four healthy chicks that in nearly all cases were fledging. And so um, we had huge numbers of birds for all species, even the small herons. Many of, you know, we didn't have huge numbers of small herons nesting. But my goodness, I've never seen so many snow egrets and tricolored heron chicks in my life. Just incredible response. Now, the aim of the bird isn't just to get these, you know, the, of the parents just to get these birds off the nest. The ultimate fitness for these birds is to get these, their youngsters breeding again the following year, or well, not the following year, but later on down the road. So, and to get them, you know, producing grandchildren for, for these adults. Um, and you know what was so important this year is that these birds fledged early and into some really excellent foraging conditions, and that is really important because young birds, they um, you know that's the toughest time of their life. As soon as they fledge, they you know they're, they're extremely naive. They don't know how to fly properly. They don't know the good feeding areas. They're naive to traffic, to you know, flying into houses and power lines, you name it. So you know, they're not world savvy. They've got to learn to become birds. And if they can do that almost on their doorstep in the Everglades, 
it's been shown that their survival in the first year of life increases dramatically. And, and actually, just to, to emphasize that, this is a photo I took this year, a few weeks ago in the Southern Everglades. It's a flock of ibis that I'm seeing. Um, and these darker birds are the young ibis from last year. The proportion of these birds in the flocks, I've never seen anything like it. Um, usually you'll see maybe five or 10% of these flocks of white ibis and, and other species um, uh, that are, you know, these, these immature birds. But not, you know, just look at that, just how many, it, in this flock in particular, it's probably about 70% juveniles. So, you know, these birds did survive that first year of life. That means they've got a very good um, chance of, of, you know, surviving now to full adulthood. Um, so, you know, you know, the, the, the populations of these birds are, are definitely probably dramatically increasing because of uh, 2018 and particularly 2021, where, where these birds were just so successful. So that was really, really encouraging. You know, these birds are long lived. So, you know, they can live um, 12, 15 years, maybe even longer. So, you know, these, these birds are gonna be back. We get conditions right. They're gonna be there to produce these super colony events again, if we can get the water right again. So probably one of the most interesting things from a scientific perspective and a, and a restoration perspective is that we also saw a return of these birds to these coastal colonies, and particularly in this, um, in this area of south, Southwest Everglades National Park, this uh, Fertile Crescent region again, where they historically nested. Um, and you know, 30,000 nests was just you know, an incredible number of nests in this region. Now, our target for that is about, is 50% 50, is 50 of all nests of the Everglades, uh, sorry, our restoration target for the Everglades restoration is to have about 50% of all nests nesting again in this, in this the coastal region. We only had 20, you know, 30,000 30, nests represents about 23% of, of all nests in the Everglades. So we're still quite a bit short of that Everglades restoration target. But to me, the, the key thing is the, is the absolute magnitude of the nesting event here. So I, I'm really not that worried that we didn't meet that 50% target. The fact that we have 30,000 nests in, you know, in, in this, in, primarily in these three colonies just means that this area is, you know, it, it's able to still support, you know, these large nesting events. If we get the water right again, if we can get flows to this region, we will be getting massive colonies down there again. So, you know, other good news. Oh, right, okay. So this is something I added today. It's a video, hopefully it's going to work. It's, let me just go back, actually, I'll show you where it is. This is the Cabbage Bay Colony. This photo here is Broad River Colony. This is another huge colony that we had, um, um, particularly in 2018. But in 2021, it was Cabbage Bay, this area here, right on the border of Southern Big Cypress National Preserve. And I just wanna show you a video of this from the air, kind of during the sort of the peak of the nesting, just to give you a sense of the scale of these nesting events. Now, excuse the video, it is just my old iPhone from a helicopter, um, but hopefully it will play all right and we'll be able to see what's going on. So this area here is primarily, um, you can, you know, it's, it's not the easiest to see, but you can make out the birds. These large nests are largely uh, uh, great egrets and wood storks in this region. And, you know, and flying over as lots of white ibis returning to their nests that I'll show you where they're nesting in a minute. Um, but mainly, and there's lots of spoonbills down in this region as well, although you probably won't be able to make out those birds. And I apologize, this, this video does shake a bit at times because of the vibrations of the helicopter. But in a minute, you, you can see how densely packed these birds are. You know, there's an awful lot of birds and you'll see it just goes on and on and on. 
So now to the right, so in the middle of the video right now is mainly wood stalks and great egrets. That's their main nesting area there. And now we're flying over on the right hand side. This is the white ibis neighborhood. And many of these nests are hidden under the trees. There were 20,000 approximately white ibis nests around here in this particular region. And it just keeps going and going. And if any, and by the way, if anyone fancies doing a count for me, this is um, this is basically what I have to do to get preliminary estimates. Um, we then take a whole bunch of photos of these colonies, stitch them all together, and um, and attempt to count them. But as you can see, it keeps on going. This is still all the white ibis. Keep going, all the white ibis, and still, still more white ibis. So for those of you who have seen, you know, have been to Wakodahatchee, I think many of you have, you know, and seen, seen the birds there, uh, that, you know, this is what nesting can be like in, in the Everglades, just huge, huge nesting events. And, um, you know, sometimes we go into these colonies, we're doing studies in these colonies, and it's just incredible that the number of birds there's alligators all in here underneath, um, um, eating all the dead chicks that fall and some of the live ones as well. I can talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, but um, I hope you enjoyed that. That just gives you a sense of just the scale of some of these colonies. So that's that was a 23,000 nest colony. That colony is only half the size, less than half the size of one of the colonies we had in 2018, um, Alley North in the northern part of the, the system, that had just shy of 60,000 nests in 2018. So, I mean, just, it's, it's amazing, some of these things. So, so the next part of my talk then is, you know, we've, we've seen all these nests, these birds have responded in these incredible ways, but why did they respond? You know, I've talked about the fact that it was wet, but why does that matter? What, what does that mean? So, so really we want to understand what it is that limits wading bird nesting in the Everglades. And in an essence, that's prey availability. It's their food, their, the, um, the aquatic animals, the small fish, the crayfish, the shrimp, um, and to a certain extent, the smaller amphibians and, you know, and other small aquatic critters. That is the main driving force of nesting in the Everglades. And, it's, and that prey availability is dictated largely by hydrologic conditions. And so when I mean hydrologic conditions, that means a multitude of things. It can mean water depth, it can mean hydro period, which basically means how long water stays above ground in the marsh. It means how quickly water levels um, rise and fall uh, in the Everglades and, and the timing of that rising and falling as well. So all these things factor in to, imp to impact what we're calling prey availability. Now this prey availability can basically be broken down into two basic components, at least for, the, uh, for, 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 the, for this presentation at least, it gets a little bit more complicated. And the first of this is prey production. We've got to make you know, lots of fishes and crayfish for these birds to eat. The more they, the more they produce, the, the, better, the better it is for the birds, basically. And so the Everglades is a fluctuating wetland. It gets wet in the wet season and it dries down in the dry season. And in these fluctuating marshes, one of the most important things is how long we have water in the system. Um, this part of, of the science is certainly not rocket science. Fish need water, crayfish need water. The longer they have water, the more they're able to produce, reproduce, grow. Um, you know, once the system dries out again, many of those fish are lost. They, they small, start again from very small population size and they have to grow again. So the more water we have in the system, the, the deeper it is, the more expansive it is from an aerial perspective. The larger the area that's wet, the better it is to produce prey for these birds. And that's sort of represented in this very simple um, 
figure here basically showing the, the abundance or the density of this bluefin killifish uh, on, a, on this uh, vertical axis, the y-axis here, in response to the day since wetting. So basically since it dried. And, and what we're seeing is this basic increase in, in, in the abundance of these fishes um, um, as we, you know, as it stays wetter and wetter. Okay, so basically the more water we have in the sort of the preceding wet, wet season before we have, you know, the breeding season of these birds, the more prey pr we produce and the better it is for the birds. That's one of the, the key aspects and, and probably the most important. Although it does get a little bit more complicated, certain species such as crayfish, they do need a certain amount of dry down to get rid of the big predatory fishes that can affect their population. So it does get a bit more complicated than that, but basically the more water we have in the system, the better for prey production. Okay, so did, so basically did um, we have these very wet conditions in the Everglades uh, prior to the 2021 breeding season? So this is a map of the Everglades. Again, um, it's hard to see where everything is with this. Um, this is um, the Lotsahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Boynton Beach would be about here. Miami is down here, Homestead, Florida Keys, et cetera. And what this is, it's a, basically a depth map on a given day in the Everglades across the entire, you know, the entire landscape of the Everglades, the water conservation areas, Everglades National Park, and part of Big Cypress over here. And so this is at the peak of the wet season. So this occurred 11th of November, 2020. This is just after Tropical Storm Eta passed through. And we have, as you can see, a very wet landscape. The scale is here. I apologize that it's in centimeters, but from a wading bird perspective, I think anything above about 30 centimeters, it, is a good thing. 30 centimeters is about a foot, 43 centimeters is about a foot and a half. Um, so anything um, you know, above this 30 centimeters is a good thing. Um, you know, we've got full coverage of that across the entire system. Uh, one thing we don't have with our hydrologic modeling, unfortunately, is the coastal region, which is very important, um, but I'll talk about that a bit later. But in general, yes, we had a very, very wet, conditions leading up into our 2021 nesting season. And just as a comparison, this is the year before, this is the peak um, uh, water depth. This occurred on the 1st of October for 2019. So these were the conditions leading into the 2020 nesting season. We can see we only had 37,000 nests this, that year, it was moderately dry. Um, and the reason is, is because half the system was, was almost dry. At the peak of the wet season, we just don't have enough water in much of the system um, to produce that, that productivity of, of aquatic organisms that, that we need. And one of the key parts, it's not just the, the entire area. Having more area covered is good, but there are also some key areas that are absolutely essential for prey production and for producing some of these super colony events. And that is these, these are the Western Mile Prairie areas, um, Southern Big Cypress, Northern Water Conservation Area 3A. This is where we have that Alley North colony that can get up to 60,000 nests. This, these Mile Prairies and Southern Big Cypress is the feeding zone of the, of the coastal colonies in the, in the um, Fertile Crescent. So these areas having this wet, is absolutely essential. Having this wet is absolutely essential. And that's what we had in 2020 that we don't usually get. And that's why we had such an enormous, uh, partly why we had such an enormous nesting response. Okay, so there's another part to um, prey availability, and that is um, prey accessibility. These these prey need to be accessible and vulnerable to these birds. So this is a figure that was produced by the Everglades Foundation. Basically, it shows um, the system drying out from the peak of the wet season, showing here in November, all the way through the dry season, which is basically the 
the wading bird's nesting season, okay? And below you can kind of see the wading bird responses to it. And it's also showing um, crayfish and fish availability. So basically what's happening here, if we start over on the left, in November, the system, the ridge and slough system is wet, very wet. It's deep, these sloughs, even though they're only two to three foot deep, you know, they flooded all the, the tree islands and the ridges and all the prey, the crayfish, the fishes, they're dispersed across the landscape. And, you know, hidden, and not only that, but it's, it's too deep for, for many of these birds. So the landscape is two to three foot deep. That's just too deep for many of these birds to forage in. But as the dry season kicks in, water levels slowly decline, the aerial coverage of the landscape shrinks and, as, and water starts moving off the ridges. And as that happens, the prey are all moving into these deeper areas. The, the area of, of where these animals are inhabiting is much smaller. And so they start to concentrate, their densities increase. And that enables the birds to be able to feed on them. These birds are not great fishermen. They're not like otters and, and um, cormorants that can chase around fish. Many of them are tactile foragers. They need to be at a de high densities that they can actually touch the bird, the, the fish and gray fish in the water to be able to grab them. So they need these high densities. And the Everglades is a low productivity system. It, it, it has low nutrients. It's not great for producing fish. So we need this sort of um, mechanical, um, this sort of dry down mechanism to be able to concentrate prey and to be able to make them available to the, to the birds like that. And that's what we're seeing as we get shallower and shallower, it get, the, the, the water gets lower and lower, the, the prey become more concentrated. And it's kind of at this kind of period where we start to see sort of these birds really beginning to feed in large numbers, starting to nest because they have the right amount of um, prey densities to be able to feed their youngsters. So that's prey accessibility. Okay, so you may have been wondering um, in those maps that I was showing, you know, if I'm showing it sort of from deep to, to shallow, why would I have a green part in the middle? And that's because these maps are, are really, you know, we use them for other things as well, but what they really are, are uh, what we call habitat suitability maps. They show the suitability of foraging for these birds in terms of the depths of the system. So, you know, after, you know, we use 20 years of foraging data across the entire Everglades landscape um, using statistical models, we were able to determine what the actual optimal depth is for foraging. And we were able to sort of, sort of categorize that into these these areas where that is green here, that is optimal for foraging. Well, actually the light blue areas is, can also be optimal for foraging as well. These blue areas tend to be too deep and these brown areas tend to be too, brown, too dry, sorry. So, you know, this is again, a single day in the Everglades. And you can see that it's highly variable across the landscape. You know, in these northern reaches of each of these conservation areas, the Everglades is on a slope from north to south. So the north dries quicker than the southern, southern areas. So we're starting to see um, green areas appearing in the north of these conservation areas. And again, in northern 3A. In, in Everglades National Park, it's a little different because we almost have sort of like miniature mountain ranges in these, um, these wet prairie areas. So it dries in a different way. Uh, but as you can see that it's very variable uh, on a single day. Now, what we want to see, let me just go back a slide again. You know, what we want to see is, is areas like this, but, you know, these areas don't last very long. You know, the, the system is drying down, the birds are eating the fish and crayfish. These fish are dying because the water gets very hot. It runs out of oxygen. So these patches of for good foraging are ephemeral. And so the birds are constantly looking uh, for new patches. They, they only last a week or two at the very most, these areas. So the birds are always searching. And so what we need is for those green areas that I was just showing you to move across the landscape and to move to areas at the right time and the right place to be able to support these, these nesting birds at these big nesting colonies. 
And so, you know, I just added this just to show you, um, you know, how these sort of optimal and too deep um, categorizations kind of, ref, you know, res, uh, reflect in terms of, you know, what water depths look like on the landscape. So, you know, this area here and, and this are the blues, the greens and the light blues really are kind of the foraging habitats that we're looking for. So, okay, so back to 2021, did we, you know, see that optimal green area move across the landscape and at the right time, at the right place, and at the right sort of dry down level to be able to provide the right amount of forage for these nesting birds? So to show that, I'm going to go through a series of these maps um, once every six weeks or so through the uh, 2021 nesting season. And I've got a couple of additional things to show as well. Um, these red circles represent where the birds were foraging. And I'm also going to show some red stars as well. That's when, that's when the, the major colonies popped up. Okay, so if we start in December 2020, so that's right at the beginning of the nesting season. By the way, this is really when we want the wood stalks to start feeding and nesting. Um, so we can see that most of the Everglades was very wet, actually far too wet for foraging. You know, we've got 43 centimeters, um, a foot and a half, at least in some areas, it was five, six foot deep in water conservation area 3A, far too deep. But what we're not seeing is the water depths here in the coastal region. And, um, this was amazing. So we had about 45,000 birds foraging in this region. That I counted. It was probably far higher than that. We haven't really noted um, before much foraging in these coastal regions before. Because there was so much flow going to these coastal regions that are usually quite, you know, heavily saline, not very productive. But this year, because of all the flows, the, the, the productivity was just off the charts in these, um, in these um, coastal regions. You've also got nutrients in this region. This area is much more nutrient enriched just because of the fact that it's, you know, you're getting nutrients, natural nutrients from the ocean. So if we get the water, con you know, hydrologic conditions right, this can be a key foraging area. And I think it was key for attracting a lot of wading birds to the Everglades keeping them in the Everglades, lots of wood stalks there. So that was keeping them down here foraging. This was what was setting up this, the start of nesting and foraging in the Everglades in 2020, 2021. Okay, so now we've, we've gone on another, another six weeks. We're at January the 20th now, and we still, we see things have changed, okay? We're still seeing large numbers, probably about 15,000, um, birds foraging above Florida Bay, um, probably similar numbers on the, on the Gulf Coast here, but I didn't get a chance to, to survey those. But critically, we're now seeing the Western Mile Prairies, Southern Big Cypress, Northern Water Conservation 3A and, and Northern 2A start to come online in terms of foraging. And we were starting to see maybe five to 10,000 birds in this region and about 8,000 birds in, in Northern 3A, which was pretty high numbers for, for early January. Right now, I'm seeing a couple of thousand along the coast here, um, maybe a couple of hundred here, um, and, and actually tens of thousands here, but um, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, now we've moved on another six weeks or so. We're on March the 1st. You know, this is when the birds, are, uh, many of the birds um, uh, are really starting to thinking about nesting. At this point though, we're also getting these stars come in. We've got net, a lot, actually, let's go back. Yes, we had nesting already started. We had spoonbills and wood star stalks already starting to nest in, in by early January uh, in these colonies, in these coastal colonies and, and one of these Southern water conservation area, 3A colonies as well. Okay, so um, in March, we're, you know, the, the, the area continues to dry down. We've got these beautiful conditions. We're not seeing major rain events. We're just seeing this wonderful gradual 
decline in water levels across the system, which is just creating these new foraging areas for these birds. These see these green areas have moved from the last one. And now we're seeing 20, 30,000 birds foraging in this region, uh, 15, 15 to 20,000 birds foraging. And now we're seeing some of these northern colonies coming online. Alley North had about 20,000 birds starting to nest. We've got some, um, another colony here, about 10,000 nests. Um, and um, birds were starting to forage a nest in, in Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge as well. And then this is the last one. It's May the 1st. We're getting towards the end of the breeding season. Quite often at this time, we, we have very little water left, very little foraging region left because it's dried out too quickly. But here we've got so much water left, um, particularly in, in central 3A. Um, we've still got very large foraging flocks across the entire system. Um, and you'll notice that down in... in um, the Mal Prairie area, this Lossman Slough area, this is steadily moving closer and closer to the colonies and um, these green areas. And that's exactly what we want to see. But what we don't want to see is it to dry out too quickly. And because there was just so much water left in these regions, um, this, this foraging lasted pretty much till the end of the, of the dry season, which was ended really late this year, actually. It didn't, the wet season didn't start till the middle of June. Um, which was a great thing because so many more birds for, um, fledged because of that. Um, but these foraging conditions, when you have it wetter, it just lasts for longer. You know, these young birds get an opportunity to be able to forage in these wonderful foraging areas. And so that this was, you know, just perfect. Um, so, you know, just to reiterate, we had, um, you know, perfect prey production. We had excellent prey production. Um, uh, across the entire area of the Everglades that produced a lot of prey across, you know, not just in certain areas, but a, a broad expanse that attracted these birds. And then we had this beautiful dry down that just created this, this wave of um, optimal foraging habitat across the system um, in the right place and at the right time to be able to support these nesting colonies. And that, you know, in a nutshell is what we want to do with Everglades restoration. Um, and a lot of what is coming down the pipeline with Everglades restoration will be able to support that. Um, now, I, I, I'm actually gonna miss that one out. Um, I, I, I added this, this slide in at the very last minute. It's, um, it's very provisional data from Everglades National Park. And I just wanted to quickly just highlight that it, you know, this was a wonderful nesting year, but it wasn't just all about the birds. Um, so this is data that I got a, a week or so ago from Everglades National Park, and it's about the alligator nesting. And so they're showing that, that it is provisional. So we've got to take it with a slight pinch of salt. Um, and I don't have all the details, but basically what they're saying is that they think it's the second highest number of alligator nests recorded since surveys began in 1985. Um, nesting was moderately successful. Two out of a preliminary estimate is roughly two out of three nests were successful, although they did have some concerns about some nest predation. And it, I don't know what to make of this at all, but that nest predation was primarily by black bears. Uh, in Everglades National Park. So I, I'm not sure what to make of that. It's, it's pretty interesting that these bears are doing that. But I think the key thing is that, you know, we saw huge numbers of, of alligators' nests. And, you know, that's to be predicted. We had a wet, wet season that produced a lot of fish. But, okay, I'm, I am going to go back to this because I think this is really interesting. And I think you'll, you guys will find it really interesting. These wading birds, you know, ecology is, is the interaction between, you know, all, you know at, these wildlife, these species don't operate, you know, in a, in a vacuum. They, you know, everything affects everything else um, from a, you know, from a species level and in terms of hydrology, nutrients, everything else, everything is interacting. Um, and these wading birds, 
have this almost symbiotic relationship with alligators. That means, you know, they have mutual benefits from one another. And the, the benefits, the, it, that doesn't really look like the case for this poor um, nestling here that's being eaten by an alligator. Um, but if, if you're at Wakoda Hatchie, you'll notice that, the, you know, these birds are nesting on, they don't really care about people being within touching distance of them on the boardwalks. What they care more about is raccoons and bobcats and, um, and, and other mammalian predators that can cause absolute havoc in a nesting colony. I mean, I've seen, you know, um, once the Everglades dries down and raccoons enter a, a colony, it creates absolute mayhem and, and widespread abandonment. So what these alligators do, having water under the nests, these alligators are attracted to these wading bird colonies and they actually serve like um, um, bodyguards and bouncers um, to these nesting colonies. They, these uh, raccoons and other animals will not venture into water that's more than a few inches deep if there are alligators around. So, you know, alligators provide this a really important protective function. And to be, to be frank, I, I don't think we would have much in the way of wading bird nesting at all if there were no alligators in the Everglades. That's how important I think they are for these, for these birds. But these birds have to pay a price for, for these alligators guarding them. And they do that um, by providing them um, dead chicks, dead um, eggs that fall out of the nests. And many of these... Um, species of wading birds uh, have what we, what we call sibling rivalry. They've, some of these older chicks can be very aggressive to the younger chicks. They force them out of the nest. And um, my colleagues at the University of um, uh, Florida, uh, Peter Frederick and his student, um, recently found that these alligators, particularly the females, they get about 40% of their entire energy requirements for nesting solely from wading bird colonies, from, from these eggs and chicks that they're eating. So, you know, the, again, these alligators are then reliant on these wading birds. And of course, alligators are, you know, these uh, keystone species that, that they create these burrows, they're nesting, creates habitat, they're burrowing in the, in the, um, um, in the, in the sediments during, during the dry season, creates um, aquatic refugia for many other species. So, you know, there's this circle that's going on here that's just um, providing, or, you, know, um, you know, mutual benefits for, for one another and for other species as well. And so, you know, with this massive amount of wading birds nesting in the system, we would actually predict that we would see an uptick in, in alligating nesting. And, you know, I was really happy to hear when I, you know, last week that that indeed was the case, that they did benefit. And, and probably that was largely due, not entirely due, but probably largely due to um, this massive wading bird nesting event that we had. Okay, so that this is the end of the first half, just to summarize it. Um, basically, we had this perfect storm of sequential hydrologic conditions um, that led to you know, this increase in prey production across the entire system. And then we had a nice dry, dry season where everything dried down and made those, um, those fish and crayfish available to, those, to these birds. So perfect foraging conditions. It was the second largest nesting event um, since the 1940s, but I'm thinking it was probably the largest recruitment event since the 1940s. And that is by far more important than having the largest nesting event. If it was indeed the largest recruitment we had, um, then that's all that we're, that's what we're really looking for. We want to get these birds back into the breeding population. Um, what we really learned is that certain areas that really haven't been online for, for you know, since the 1930s and 40s, um, particularly the Mile Prairies, Southern Big Cypress that are typically too dry, these areas are critical foraging habitat they are the areas that are supporting um, these super colony events on the coast that we're you know, desperately trying to recover. And so hydrating some of those areas is gonna be 
um, really important in terms of Everglades restoration. Um, and then finally, you know, just what we're observing here just highlights, you know, that we have hope. The Everglades and the wading birds are resilient. If we can get these kind of hydrologic conditions back again, these wading birds will return. Um, and, you know, I think that's really the take home message and, and what's so important about, you know, about what we're seeing here. Okay, so um, how much time do we have? How much time do I have to go through the second part? What time do we finish? Yep. So we are at, let's see, about 10 minutes over right now. Great. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's such great information. Yeah. <laughs> so I can carry on or I can stop and take questions now. We can do it either way. Um, or I can quickly just go through some of these. Um, yeah, why don't we do... Five minutes. Yeah, why don't, why don't we do another five minutes and then see if we can get just a couple of questions in. Okay. We'd love to see some of your photos. Okay, so yes, let's, so, okay. So now I'm going to just very quickly run through some of these. So this is Florida Bay, just, you know, just before the, you know, the storm is approaching a few days before. So, uh, uh, you know, a key thing to think about Florida Bay, it historically was, you know, much lower salinities historically. That's what we need um, in terms of you know, healthy seagrass beds, um, production of all the critters that live there, the, you know, the seabirds, the, the fish, the, the shorebirds. Um, it, it seems that they do much better when we have these sort of lower salinities in Florida Bay, but I, I won't expand on that. Um, now this, <laughs> Sabina thinks this looked like the back of an eyeball that you see when you go to the office. But what it is, is, is something I've never seen before. This is a Garfield bite. This is just offshore in Florida Bay. And what we're seeing here are these dendritic patterns of flow into the bay of fresh water. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, this down here is a 10 foot alligator. Um, and that's another thing I haven't seen before. These alligators right in the, you know, in the middle of the bay. And the reason is, is because there's fresh water and you can probably see all this disturbance here. These are fish. You know, we're, we're, we're probably at a sort of zone here where we're getting the fresh water and the salt water. These fish are congregating in this area and this alligator's sort of enjoying that, you know, that high density of fish there. And that, this is just that alligator, just show what, you know, big boy. He's a big, healthy alligator. Many of the alligators we see in the Everglades are often quite skinny and starved. This guy has obviously been feeding very well. He's, you know, been enjoying that, that, sorry, been enjoying that, um, you know, the high productivity of, of these flows and what it's producing in, in Florida Bay. Um, this is a photo, this is the same area, just to show it's not just the alligators that are, you know, making, taking advantage of all this. These are um, av American avocets. Um, you add fresh water to this system, you're going to increase the productivity of invertebrates. And, and I think that's why we see, we were seeing so many shorebirds there, there this year. Um, this one's kind of interesting. It kind of, it, this is just maybe a mile or two to the east of Flamingo. Um, it's a little outflow from the Everglades and it looks like pollution, but actually that's, it's, it's the tannins from the decaying leaves of um, the mangrove leaves. Basically, it's just like tea. It's the, the tannins from those decaying leaves. It's, it's you know, it's, it's healthy. We can see, look at this, you know, this is the, the bay here. We can see this sort of sharp demarcation here between the fresh water coming in and, and, the, and the bay. Um, um, but actually, this is really important. We, we've learned from some of our fisheries scientists that uh, many of the, the game fish use this, the, the smell of these tannins to, to to swim upstream to their spawning areas and to their feeding areas. So, so it's, a, it's an important component. We, and we, um, but I've, you know, we don't often see flushes of tannins quite like this. This is just because we had so much flow coming out um, and uh, you know, it created this big flush of tannins. You know, um, and my job at the time really wasn't to sort of show all these flows. And you know, I'm really here to you know, count wading birds and see what's going on with these things, with these birds. And, um, you know, boy, did did I see them? But it was kind of 
really interesting in the fact that I, I was expecting to see them way back, maybe half a mile in, you know, within the mangroves feeding. But these guys are actually feeding along the coast. The, the productivity here must have been crazy for, for them to be able to do that. Um, but of course, I did actually see them further back as well in their you know, tens of thousands. They were just really taking advantage. Um, you know, by the way, this is a mangrove area. It's an area that was um, killed off by uh, Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um, talking about white pelicans, we were seeing, um, you know, this shows hundreds of um, roosting American white pelicans. You know, these are huge birds. They've got a nine foot wingspan and huge appetites to boot. The, the bay needs to be really productive to be able to support large numbers of these. And, you know, and the, this is just a testament to just how, you know, productivity increased with these flushes of flows going into the bay. Oh, and um, I, I said hundreds, but actually thousands, um, many thousands of American white pelicans. These are all American white pelicans. This is just one flock of many. I estimated between about 13 and 15,000 American white pelicans, which corresponds to about 13 to 15% of the entire you know, North American population was hanging out in Florida Bay in, in 2021. So just you know, huge numbers. And you know, in the freshwater system as well, huge numbers. Um, you know, we really are we get the water right, we are going to have these wildlife spectaculars on our doorstep yet again. And, it, and, and I was lucky to get to be witness to some of it in, in 2021. Sorry, this is my final white pelican slide. I, I just love this one just because, you know, this is the tannin stained water. I like these shapes. You know, this is what I'm looking for when I'm taking photos, these shapes, these colors. This was a really strange sort of almost um, bluish green, natural algae, um, not, you know, not one of these poisonous out, you know, harmful algaes, um, but, you know, just a, a beautiful color contrast there. Wasn't just pelicans and, um, you know, seabirds as well. This, some of the largest flocks of black skimmers and terns that I've, I've ever seen in Florida Bay along the coast of um, Florida Bay here. Here's another one, you know, this, this reminded me more of being back in England and the gloomy weather and seeing, you know, just this one um, shaft of sunlight coming through here and backlighting these birds. That's an amazing photo, that last one, yeah, stunning. Um, I call this um, 100,000 um, shorebirds, not because there's 100,000 here, but it, it's so difficult to represent this from a photo from the air, but, you know, this just, this kind of densities of these little dots, they're all shorebirds, uh, mainly small sandpipers here, um, it just went on and on and on and on. It, it was just incredible. Um, uh, but of course, I did get some closer images as well. I called this one the non-conformist because everyone seems to know the direction to go, apart from this one, uh, a guy in the middle here. Um, and, um, you know, I just love seeing some of the artwork that these birds can produce as well in the system. So again, American avocets. Um, foraging in these tannin stained waters, um, but whatever the avocets can do, um, these marble godworts and willets um, can do better, or at least in a more abstract way. Um, wasn't just shorebirds, thousands of uh, waterfowl as well, you know, ranging from um, redheads to um, um, ruddy ducks, um, coots, um, scorp. Um, you know, historically, these birds were there in the hundreds of thousands. We didn't see that this year, but um, we, did, we did see, you know, at least tens of thousands. And with all those waterfowl, we had, you know, the predators came in, particularly the, the bald eagles. This is a, 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 a sort of a unique angle of a bald eagle from above, um, looking right down into the nest. And yes, um, you can't probably make it out in this here, but... These are all the remains of some of these waterfowl while the bird was sitting on the nest. Um, kind of an interesting story of how I got this. I'm, you know, this bird is not disturbed, even though I'm in a helicopter, we're about 600 feet above it. But my pilot has to 
um, to, for me to be able to get this photo, he has to t do these really, really tight circles, um, almost sort of, you know, G-forces with, so the helicopter is actually turned on its side so I can actually shoot directly down. So um, um, kind of vomit inducing <laughs> um, way of uh, producing, of getting an image. Uh, so these um, Bald Eagles weren't restricted to just um, the Southern Everglades. This is in Loxhatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Actually, this is one of my favorite bald eagle nests. It, it produces two chicks regularly each year. Uh, ironically, it was in a tree that I termed called, um, in fact, fatalistically, I termed it the tree of life. Um, it was this huge uh, uh, um, slash pine tree that stood way above everything else in the, in the marsh. Um, and then for some reason, a couple of years ago, it died, but it's still supporting that nest and has done for the last couple of years. Um, this is actually a photo I took just after it died. It, you can see the tree just sticking out. I love photographing in these foggy conditions. Um, just gives such a wonderful atmosphere to, you know. So our social security, Dan, is going to be about $3,500. Oh. <laughs> um, so, That's yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> Yeah, I and mean, that's the same nest a, a, year, a year later that was taken last year. So we're slowly starting to see the decay of that tree. And I'm hoping yeah. another foggy shot this year, and hopefully that nest will be. It wasn't just bald eagles, other predators. We've got dolphins. These were way, these were about 10 miles up um, Shark River Slough, way up into the freshwater system. Freshwater system was being very productive. So many dolphins up there. I'd not seen that before, so that was interesting. Um, American uh, crocodiles, um, you know, these are a flagship species, uh, indicator of, um, you know, um, brackish conditions in the bay. These require about 50% salt water, 50% fresh water. They don't like to, you know, their water too salty. They, uh, the nest success, their growth is just so much better when there's fresh water flowing into the bay. Um, just a shot of um, the Mile Prairies with you know, thousands of uh, white ibis. Again, white ibis flying over Mbal prairies. This is what it was all about. This is the main, the most important creature probably in the Everglades. This is the, um, the, the Everglades crayfish found in the Mile prairies. That's what's supporting these super colonies. Um, this large flocks, you know, you, we think we see large numbers of birds on our lawns. You know, we're seeing this, this is just one of about, 15 flocks, you see one after the other after the other of white ibis, great egrets, and others in the northern Everglades near the Alley North colony. So just incredible numbers of birds. Again, flying over a burned area. Burning is important. The Everglades just, you know, some of that veget historically naturally burnt. So um, we do still need to, to have burns. With all that foraging, we're starting to get nesting, the great egret here wood stalks starting to nest, um, you know, and, you know, listening to Carl Safina last, you know, the last month, you know, I'm a total advocate of what he's saying, you know, I've been studying animal behavior all my life. I, I do believe they're far more intelligent, far more empathetic, far more human-like than we ever possibly imagined. And just go and watch the wood stalks of, at Wakodahatchee prior to their breeding, showing you know that they do actually appear we can't say for certain but um they do appear to you know show these emotions um some sort of a connection to one another anyway i won't go in but they don't like their neighbors necessarily this is a instance of kleptoparatism that's basically means uh, parasitism by theft this poor male on the left here brought a stick in um, to his female to start making her nest and these nasty neighbors stole it from them. Um, I don't really need a title on this one. I think you know what uh, they're doing, but I just really wanted to show that these, they, they are beautiful birds. Look, you know, you catch their feathers in the right light, the blue, the greens and the purples, the iridescence. Um, and also during the breeding season, you get this uh, sort of this peach flush under their wings as well. So you know, they really are beautiful birds. Um, this was really interesting. I, <laughs> Uh, th this is a photo taken about an hour after sunset. 
um, I, I could barely see. It's only because I've got a really good sensor on my camera. This is the first we knew that these, these birds forage during the night. Um, and and they, can, they, can, they have pretty good eyesight and they can probably see one another. And it probably helps them take advantage of, um, of the tidal systems that they you know, typically forage in. Um, and you know what? I think I'm just gonna skip to the end. I'm just gonna go through some of these photos as a colony, colony, colony. That's what a white ibis looks like as a chick. This is that um, um, photo of those dead, you know, earlier I showed you those dead stalks. This is the same area just to show, you know, the contrast this year, how successful they were. Um, and I think, I, I, I'm sh why am I showing a raccoon? It's the first raccoon I've seen in the Everglades for the last five or 10 years. Um, you know, the snakes have eaten, you know, the pythons have done a real number on them. Um, so, you know, it's really good to see a raccoon. Um, shark nesting areas in the Everglades, incredible. Um, and the final photo is just of a flamingo I found on Cape Sable in June of 2021. Hopefully we'll get them back. So, and um, I know I've gone over, so I'm gonna leave it there. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was so information rich. And I think um, when we have you back again, maybe we do a two-parter so that we can make sure that um, we get all the information that we want. I mean, that's just incredible. And um, I, I'm kind of speechless, so I want to move on to some questions really quickly. Uh, we can go for about five minutes here. Um, Kathy Ambach wants to know, where are these birds nesting um, in the years when, they're, when their numbers drop in the Everglades? Um, they're, well, they're either not nesting, potentially. Sometimes they need a break. If they don't get into breeding conditions, they may not nest. Or they're, they're nesting elsewhere throughout the southeast, anywhere throughout the southeastern region of the United States, or, or even into Cuba and, and other regions. Um, you know, these birds, they, obviously they fly, they can travel vast distances. They're always searching around, looking for um, the optimal place to nest, which is why showing, you know, that area in, the, on, in December on the coast was important because, you know, if we don't attract the birds to the Everglades early in the season, this is where they all come to first. They're all migrating down here. They start south. If conditions aren't good here, they're, they're moving elsewhere, looking further north for, for other foraging areas. So okay. to keep them down here, you know, in that early part of the nesting season. Very good. So but they could be nesting anywhere. In addition to the large uh, wading birds that you've discussed, um, can you speak to the population of purple gallinules in the past few years? Um, this is I, from Carol Rosowski. I think she's seen an explosion. Yeah, I, of, he's seen an explosion of purple gallinules. Um, that that's interesting. Um, I don't. Well, it says, can you speak to the population of it? So yeah, I'm not. Yeah, quite sure. I I don't I don't know what the pop. I'm sorry, I don't know what the population trends of the. Okay. The ha have there been similar successes with the roseate spoonbills? Well, it's it, yes and no. So um, you know the the roseate spoonbill is an indicator species in its own right, but for Florida Bay. Um, mm. Florida Bay, we are not seeing good numbers there. You know, we used to have historically 1,000, 1,200 nesting pairs in, in Florida Bay, pretty good numbers. And, you know, now we're down to 300, 200 nests. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be, you know, it seems to be dropping. However, what we are seeing is those birds moving inland. Um, that, that doesn't reflect well on the foraging and nesting conditions in Florida Bay, but it does reflect on good, better conditions in Everglades, the freshwater Everglades. So last year, actually in 2020, we had record numbers. We had almost a thousand uh, spoonbill nests in the freshwater Everglades. This year we had, I think over 800, so again, um, a phenomenal number in the freshwater Everglades. And if we go back 10 years, we were seeing five, 10, 20 at most. Mm. And now we're seeing, you know, almost a thousand. So 
Um, they're doing well, but we'd like to be, see them do well in, in Florida Bay. Okay, very good. Um, a couple of people are wondering about the effects of the Burmese pythons on the birds. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. How are, well, um, I'm not studying that directly. Uh, my colleague, Peter Frederick at the University of Florida, he's, he's just retired, but his, his students have been studying that and, and they are seeing an effect. Um, they, they use camera traps um, and they're frequently seeing with those camera traps, which you know, a very small proportion of, of the birds, um, they're still seeing a large, you know, you think if you put out maybe 50 cameras, you might see one event and they're seeing, um, you know, a lot more than one event. I, d I don't know what the details are, but basically th their conclusion is that these, these birds can be having an effect. Um, okay. When we are seeing these massive super colony, uh, oh, sorry. And I will also add that when we were working in those colonies, um, in, in Everglades National Park, looking at you know, the diets of these ibis, we were, you know, these, these snakes are really cryptic and, and difficult to see. We were seeing them on a regular basis. And I did actually see the first example, uh, first instant of a, of a snake actually capturing and eating um, a young white ibis. Mm. Mm. So they mm. are having an effect, but I, my, my, and my thought is, if we can get these massive colonies back again, that will kind of outswamp some of you know the, the the predation effect. But also by doing that, we're probably going to increase alligator populations, and increasing alligator populations will probably minimize potentially minimize the effects of those snakes. Well, that, Interesting. That, yes, because it's all connected. Yeah. So let me. Um, one final question a couple people um, were asking is how can water managers can they sort of can, can they send flows where they're needed and what are they doing right now um, uh, to increase uh, flows right so um, or are we just depending on storms well um, to a certain extent so so the response of 2021 and 2018 was largely driven by climatic events, but certainly it was helped by water management. Um, we, in, so if we have water in the system, there's nothing we can do during dry years. If we don't have the water and we don't have the storage, you know, that, that's an issue. But you know, during these wet years, it, it is largely possible to some extent to move water around, either to dry it out in certain places or to add water to certain areas uh, to help. And that and that's certainly been the case. And you know, within the last few years, that has become you know much easier. We are seeing these restoration projects come online. We are seeing um, you know increases in the size of the stormwater treatment areas. So that's helping more water. We're seeing these um, flow equalization basins, which are basically shallow reservoirs that can help store water. We are seeing the Maya, you know, the Tamiami Trail uh, bridges that allows more water to flow. We're seeing improvements in the, the C111 area, which is the, the canal system near Taylor Slough, which allows more water to flow through Taylor Slough. So, you know, and then there's many more in the, in the pipeline. Um, we have this new system about to come in line, you know, LOSUM, I'm sure you've heard all about that, that is um, supposed to deliver four times the amount of water to the Everglades. I've, I've yet to investigate that thoroughly, so I can't really speak on that for the moment, but it, it certainly sounds like it's going to improve things. So, yes, there are certain, certain things that, that water management can do that's going to just improve. We're going to have reservoirs and everything else. Um, so there will be more water available. Um, yeah, so, so yes, that good, good. Part, parcel of Everglades restoration. Well, I think we're going to have to cut our question and answer short. I, I wanted to pass on some comments to you. 
from folks. Uh, it was an amazing presentation, informative, beautiful photographs. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, wish we had more time. <laughs> I know. Um, I... <laughs> great presentation and photography. Thanks for some good news and just wonderful. Thank you. So lots of thank thanks, you. Mark. Well, uh, thank you all for listening. I mean, that that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, spread the good word, you know, have you guys help us spread the good word that, you know, Everglades restoration can work. We just need that water. You know, it, it's it's great that I can get this out to everybody. So thank you so much. So many people, you know, logged in today. That was that's that's great as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I'm so happy we had so many people. Thanks. Yeah. And we could all use some good news, right? <laughs> These days. So, yeah. 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 That was encouraging. All right. So um, I think that'll wrap things up. Scott, uh, did you want to come back on just for some final I'll words? Yeah. I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Mark, that was wonderful. You got so many compliments. I mean, uh, Marianne only read some of them. Um, great presentation, so informative. And again, the good news is always so welcome. Uh, Marianne, great job co-hosting. I thank you for everything tonight. And everybody have a great month. Get out there and bird. It's weather is warm. Hopefully it'll cool down a little bit. Uh, so, so next week, um, Next month, we will have Sarah Ayers Rigsby of FAU when flows return to the River of, Gla of Grass on February 1st. Please join us then. Until then, I bid thee adieu and have a great evening. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.